Okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. This is class eight. Uh, we're kind of we looked at some methods of proof. We're going to circle back and see those uh, a little more later uh, this semester. But today, what I want to do is circle back to some of the formal languages stuff and some of the automata stuff from the uh, semester. And the main uh, stuff that I want to get through today is uh, at least started on today is a topic called deterministic finite automata. Now. Other than knowing that that's the name of this class, automata and formal languages, you probably don't have any idea what a deterministic finite automata means. So we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about that and getting familiar with that. But before we do that, uh, there's a little bit more stuff with sets that I want to do. And one of the things that we need to, and this is going to be useful for us for what we're going to do today. All right, so Cartesian product, that's a set operation. So in other words, if we have two sets, set one and set two, we can use this cross operator, the Cartesian product operator, and that's going to produce a new set. So the set of the Cartesian product is equal to S1 crossed with S2. And what that does is it creates a set that consists of pairs where the first element of the pair is an element of set one, and the second one is an element of set two. So in other words, the, this is all of the things from set one and all the things from set two and every combination you could ever have combined in pairs like this. Now, it'll probably make more sense to have an example. So here's an example. We have set one is the set containing just two elements, two and four. Set two has three elements, five, six, seven. So when we cross those, S1 cross with S2, we have all of the possible combinations. So think about this as 2 with 5, 2 with 6, 2 with 7, 2, 5, 2, 6, 2, 7. And then the next one, 4 with 5, 4 with 6, 4 with 7, 4, 5, 4, 6, 4, 7. And a good way to make sure you got all those is think about this has the length of set, set 1 uh, is 2, the length of set S2 is 3, and we multiply those, so 2 times 3 is the number of combinations we get. 2 times 3 is 6, and here are 6 pairs that came out of that. Also notice that it's not, it's so it's kind of like concatenation, but it produces these in pairs, not just crammed together like concatenation of languages did. So these are in pairs. Now the general form uh, of that uh, Cartesian product is you can really cross any number of sets you want together and instead of getting pairs you get triplets or quadruplets or quintuplets or however many things you want. So it's just going to create this tuple out of those that the first uh, item here comes from the first set, the second one from the second set, the third one from the third set. And it's giving you every possible combination uh, of those is going to be in the cross of the element. Okay, functions. Another thing that we need to talk about, because that's going to be helpful for us today. A function is basically some sort of a, a rule or a definition that assigns elements of one set to corresponding elements uh, of another set. And one of the things that notice it has to be unique elements uh, for what this assigns. So in other words, you can't have S1 going to one thing and also going to a different thing. In other words, you can't have duplicates in uh, the set one. And that's the domain set, and this is the range set. So just like in math, when you talk about functions having a domain and range, uh, and you have to ha cannot have duplicates in the set one uh, side. So if all elements of the domain set, set one, are mapped to something in set two, then it's called a total function. If some of the elements in some set S1 we had didn't map to anything, it's called a partial function. Now, one of the ways that we can represent uh, functions is as a set of ordered pairs, uh, which we saw ordered pairs earlier in that cross. And notice that what this is saying is x element x1 maps to y1, and x2 maps to y2, and x3 maps to y3. Now, these are all kind of just generic placeholder uh, abstractions, but that could be uh, anything we want. So, but the x is the thing in the tuple, each of these pairs before the comma, that's a domain element, and the thing after the comma would be the range element. So the domain in this case would be x, all the x's, 
and the range would be all the y's. And one thing uh, to remember again is to be defined as a function, each xi can only occur once. So I couldn't have x1 here and then x1 again later because then it wouldn't be a function. It would still be a relation, but it would not be a function. Now, a little bit more, and then we're going to dig into this DFA, deterministic finite automata uh, thing. Now, graphs. A graph uh, is a kind of construct, and it consists of two finite sets. And notice that it says finite there. That's important. You cannot have an infinite-sized graph. The graph has to have a finite number of vertices and a finite number of edges. They both have to be finite. And V, it, we're going to use for the vertices. E, we're going to use for the edges. So it's just a set of those things. And every edge that's in here is going to be a pair that consists of two vertices. So it's a, basically a pair that's selected from V crossed with itself. So in other words, every possibility of uh, vertices crossed with every other, uh, the same set of vertices. So in other words, we can think of the edge, an edge element, as a pair of two vertices. This is a link between two vertices. It connects from Vj to Vk. And in our terminology here, that pair, this, it's an outgoing edge from the first one and an incoming edge to the second one. And that would make this a directed graph because we're going out of this one into that one. All right. Probably good to look at an example. So here's an example graph, vertices V. There are three vertexes, three vertices. Uh, and then edges, we've got one, two, three, four, five edges. And the edges are all connections between two vertices. So notice the first one, here's a, here's a picture of it. V1, V2, and V3. So notice we have an edge V1 going out of V1 into V3. That's this line right here going across, and then we have one from V3 back to V1, so out of V3, leaving that, going into V1, V3 to V2, V2 to V2, it's okay to have them connect back to themselves, and then V3 back to V3. So this picture kind of captures all of the uh, things of that graph, and maybe it's a little bit easier to uh, visualize or understand what's going on there. Now, a few final definitions before we get to the uh, DFAs, and that is a legal sequence of edges, which means that we have to pick edges. These kind of connect like dominoes, where, the, where this one ended is where that one begins. So this VJ has to match, VK would have to match, and so forth. But a legal sequence of those is called a walk from this vertex to that vertex. So in other words, uh, we would leave somewhere and then get somewhere else. That's called a walk. It just has to be a legal sequence of edges. So in other words, we can't make up these. They have to be one of the things that's in our set of edges. Now, the length of a walk is the number of edges in that sequence. One thing to notice about a walk that I don't have curly braces around this, because it's not a set, it's a sequence. Just like a string is not a set, it's a sequence, a walk, uh, list of these, uh, sequence of these edges is not a set, so you don't put curly braces around that. All right, final page uh, of uh, definitions. A walk that has no edge repeated is called a path. So if we can think about we cross an edge, you mark it or you burn that bridge down, and then you go again. So in other words, a walk where we never cross the same bridge twice is called a path. A walk where we never visit the same vertex more than once is called a simple path. And a walk from some vertex where we go through the, the, the graph and then we get back to that same vertex somehow, that's called a cycle, and the base of the cycle is the vertex we started at and the one that we ended at. And if no vertices are repeated other than the one we started and ended at, which can only appear at the very beginning and at the end of the sequence, can't have it visited in the middle anywhere, then that's called a simple cycle. So it's a cycle 
that goes uh, fr leaving from some place, getting back there, never visiting it again along the way, uh, and never repeating any vertex or visiting the same thing along the way. That's a simple cycle. All right, let's look at a quick example. So here's that example we had earlier. You'll notice that V1 to V3, V3 back to V3, V3 to V2, V2 back to itself. That's a path. Those were all legal edges. So in other words, uh, we just followed these arrows and that was fine. Uh, we didn't make up arrows that didn't exist. We didn't like, uh, like go across this one and then teleport back to here and do it again. So it has to be, uh, think of it as leaving this city, traveling across this road, going down that road out in the country, back to that city, across there to there. So that's a path. Now V1 to V3 and V3 to V2, that's a simple path because no vertices were repeated. V1 to V3, V3 back to V1 is a simple cycle because we left V1 and we eventually got back there and we didn't repeat any repeatedly visit any other vertices other than when we started at that we got back to. And then V1 to V3, V3 back to itself, and then V3 to V1 is a cycle, but it's not a simple cycle because we visited this vertex twice. We left it, came back to it, and then we went on. So that's a cycle, not a simple cycle. And both of these are cycles with base V1 because that's where we started and that's where we finished. Okay, so keep those that terminology in mind. Uh, we're going to use that uh, some in the future. All right, quick review of regular expressions. Uh, regular expressions uh, were a method of defining a language. Uh, it's kind of a restricted way of defining languages to only what regular expressions can define. Uh, we don't haven't looked beyond that yet. A language is a set of strings over some alphabet. An alphabet is a finite, non-empty uh, set of symbols uh, that we can choose from. And then a string is a sequence of symbols chosen from some alphabet. So finite sequence of symbols chosen from some alphabet. So the question comes up is that we have some string and we want to know if it belongs to a language that's defined by some regular expression. So let's look at an example. So here's an example. We have a regular expression, a star b, that whole thing plus, followed by a, b, or lambda, with b plus after that, and a star after that, and b, and then parentheses around that, and a plus. Is this string, a, b, a, b, b, a, b, 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 in that language or not? And notice it can be confusing because we have a, b. Well, we can tell that we can get that here, a, and then b. So we just got an AB, but there's a plus, which lets us go back and get another AB if we wanted to. There's another AB, which then the next thing is B. But then over here, this can't start with a B with AB. But yeah, it can because we could take the lambda and then have B plus. But then we also don't know, uh, was this B part of that B plus? Or, yeah, it would have to be, but then we have A star. So the answer is yes to this, but notice it can get very confusing. And what we would want is to have some way that's foolproof, like a machine, that we can feed a string into, and it'll tell us either yes, that's in this language, or no, it's not in that language. And right now, notice we have to think about this, and we can get really confused, and we might say, no, I don't think it is, but maybe it is. And we don't want that. We want to always be able to know the answer. Does this belong to that language? Do we either accept it or do we reject it? Do we say yes or do we say no? And that's what a DFA is. So a DFA, a deterministic finite automaton, is a string accepting machine. So given a string, it's going to answer that question for us. It's going to be the thing that tells us whether or not that belongs to that uh, language or not. All right, so to start with, uh, what does the word automata mean? Automata is plural. Automaton is singular. And if you go to the, uh, I went to dictionary.com or uh, one of those, Web Merriam-Webster, whatever, and got the definition, just to a screenshot of it and put it here. So notice that uh, 
plural could be automatons or automata. We're using automata for this class. And notice that there are three definitions that show up um, in the dictionary. One is a mechanical figure or contrivance constructed to act if, if, or as if by its own motive power, like a robot. So think of it like a uh, android or robot that's kind of doing things and it is either designed to act like it's doing things on its own. Number two is a person or animal that acts in a monotonous routine manner without active intelligence. So you might have somebody that works in a factory and they just sit there all day and they stamp something uh, as it comes across there. That would be somebody who's behaving uh, like an automaton. Or maybe you have a real automaton that's like a robot that's just doing uh, some repeated task over and over again. And then the third one is something capable of acting automatically without uh, an external motive force. So something that like a, maybe like a automatic door that you get near it, it opens, you walk away, it closes. That's something that's uh, behaving like an automaton. Now in our case, the kind of, uh, all of these sort of fit, but in automata, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're creating this abstract model of a machine that's a string accepting machine and the way you can think of it is think of it like a robot that when we feed it a string, it eats the string and it says, yes, that's in my language or no, that's not in my language. So think of it like the, it has a language that's designed inside of it that is designed to be the acceptor for it. And we feed it a thing, it eats it and it says, yes, yummy, or it says, no, I don't like it. And we can design the internal workings of that machine to accept uh, whatever language we want it to accept. At least there are some languages we could not make one for, but we'll, we'll get to that later on. Now, formally, formally uh, the way we define this machine for this robot is by this quintuple, uh, a tuple with five parts. And those are usually labeled as Q, Sigma, Delta, S, and F. Now let's look at each of those parts one at a time. So Q is a finite set of states. So it has to be finite. You're not allowed to have an infinite sized machine. Um, so it has to have a finite set of states. Q1, Q2, all the way up to Qn. It could be a large number, but it has to be finite. All right, sigma. That's our alphabet. That's a finite set of input symbols that make up the strings that we're going to feed to it. That's called the input alphabet. Delta is what's called the transition function. And that has to be a total function that maps all of the elements of Q cross sigma. Now, one way to think about that, we'll, we'll mention that in a second, uh, but it maps elements of Q cross sigma, which again, the cross produces pairs. So this is a state symbol pair being mapped to some resulting state. And it has to be a total function. Every one of these Q cross sigma things has to be in our transition function. So what it's doing is it's mapping state symbol pairs to a new state. In other words, this machine says, if I'm in this state and this symbol comes in on the string, that's the next symbol on the string, then I transition to this new state. S is the initial start state that has to be just a single element that says when the machine starts up, it starts in this state. And then F is the final or accepting states, and those have to be a subset of our states. So in other words, uh, the, fu uh, the final states, uh, the way that that is organized is if the machine stops and it's in a final state. So if it stops in a final state, then it reports yes or true. That string is in its language. If it stops and runs out of input in a non-final state, it reports false or no. So every state has to be either final or non-final but only one state is allowed to be the start state. Now, how the DFA machine works, this is a lot of text on here. Um, so I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly, quickly and then we'll look at an example. So the machine, when it fires up, it always starts in the start state S. And the input string is always at the leftmost input symbol for that uh, string. The machine then reads in an input symbol. It creates this, uses the state that it's in, which is always gonna be the start state initially to create a pair with that. And now it has a state symbol pair. 
it looks that up in the transition function. It will only appear once because it's a function. It's not a relation, it's a function, so they're all unique. And it's a total function, so everyone is represented. So it'll find that in the function, and then the machine state will become uh, the range element of that, what results from the output of that function. And now the machine is in a new state. That symbol is then thrown away, consumed. And then that process is going to repeat. So it'll repeat that process and each move of the automaton. Every time it pulls a thing off the string, it looks it up in the table, takes the state that it's in, the symbol that came in, that transitions to a new state, and it's just going to continue repeating that until it runs out of input symbols. And since strings have a finite number of input symbols, it'll eventually run out. And when it does run out, uh, the whatever state that it ended in, It'll report except if the state that it was in was one of the final states, an element of f, and reject if the state that it's in is q minus f. In other words, if it's not a final state, and the machine will halt. So it'll tell. So in other words, it'll chew up a string, run through all of the symbols in the string, and then it'll stop and it'll say yes, or it'll say no. It'll say accept, or it'll say reject. And It'll also uh, immediately halt and return reject if we pass it a symbol that's not part of the, uh, not defined in the transition function or a symbol that's not part of the alphabet. It'll just say, no, I don't need that kind of thing. Don't like it. No. All right, so here's an example DFA. And again, here are the five parts. Set of states. I've got three states. Here's my input alphabet, only A and B. Here's my uh, transition function. And remember, I've got three states, two symbols. I have to ha represent all of those. It has to be a total function. So I'm going to have three times two. I should have six of these, which I do. And I have every combination of 0a, 0b, 1a, 1b, 2a, 2b, and where they transition to. The start state is q0. The final state, there's only one of them. q1, you could have more than one final state, but in our case, only Q1. Now that machine accepts string for some language. We're not sure what that language is yet. But another way we could think about that is we can also think about it as defining a language. So how can that machine define a language? Well, the way it defines a language is that the machine accepts strings for some language so if we think about that, the set of all strings that are accepted by that DFA is the language that's defined. And remember back to the definition of a language, it's just a, a set of strings over some alphabet. Well, we definitely have an alphabet. And we have some set of possible strings that it says yes for. So that is the language that's defined by a DFA. So the language defined by a DFA, M, is the set of strings over uh, E, in other words, chosen from alphabet star that are accepted by that DFA M. So formally, the language of machine M, which is a DFA, is all strings W such that W is an element of sigma star, the alphabet star. So in other words, zero or more symbols uh, from our alphabet stuck together such that when we apply the transition function, uh, the star means zero or more times that uh, starting with S and passing it the string W, we end up in a final state. So in other words, if we can start with S, consume then all of the string by using multiple uh, zero or more applications of the transition functions, and if that can get us to F, that string belongs in that language. All right, now one convenient way uh, to represent or visualize these DFAs is by drawing a graph of it. And we saw graphs earlier with circles and arrows connecting them. So we're going to kind of modify that kind of drawing just a little bit uh, to help us uh, modify or help us visualize how these DFAs work. So a DFA graph, we're going to use the vertices or the circles to represent the states. We're going to use the edges to represent transition function elements because it's leaving one state going to another one. And we're going to label those transitions with the symbol that caused it to change from one state to the other state. So the start state is usually going to be Q0, whatever the first one is. 
uh, we're going to represent that on our drawing with a little zigzag arrow that points to it. So we're going to say, this is where you start. And the final states we have to represent somehow, we're going to put double circles around those rather than just a single circle. So formally, the graph for some machine M, G sub M, has uh, Q, the length of Q vertices, each one labeled with the name of the state, labeled with all of the elements of Q. So in other words, all of Q, every one of the elements of Q is a state. We're going to label them as such. We're going to draw a circle. We're going to label them with the name of those uh, things in that state set. Every transition function, we're going to make an edge on our graph that leaves from QI and goes to QJ. So in other words, that's what this transition function said. Go from here to there. On that symbol, we're going to label it with the symbol that causes the transition. And then the vertex associated with the S is the initial vertex. Uh, the vertices that are in the, that are final vertices are the final vertices. All right, so let's look at an actual example. So here's our example. Q1, this is the example from earlier, Q0, Q1, Q2, alphabet A, B, there's my transition function, there's Q0 as the start state, Q1 as the final state. So what does the graph look like? There it is there. So notice, Q0, Q1, Q2 are all state lab labeled as states, uh, which are in vertices or circles around them. A comma B is my uh, alphabet. You'll notice that it, since it's a solved function, Q0 will have an A leaving it and a B leaving it. Q1 will have an A leaving and a B leaving. Q2 will have to have an A leaving and a B leaving. Now our transition function defines the edges. So notice, let's take a look at this one. From Q0 on an A, we go to Q1. So when I look at my graph, from Q0 on an A, we go to Q1. Q0 on a B, we stay in Q0. Q0 on a B goes back to 0. Q1 on an A goes to 2, 1 on an A goes to 2, 1 on a B stays in 1, 2 on an A goes to 1, 2 on A goes to 1, 2 on B stays in 2, 2 on B stays in Q2. And then the final thing, start state is Q0, there's my little lightning bolt arrow, and then uh, final state is Q1, it has a double circle. So. A couple quick examples here that you uh, might think through. A push button. You push to turn it on. You push it again to turn it off. So let me just switch over to a little document camera here, and we'll talk about that one. And uh, here, I need a blank sheet of paper, so I'm going to pause for just a second, and I'll be right back with the document camera set up. Okay, we're back. I have a document camera set up now. Uh, so that we had said that we wanted to make a DFA for a power button. We said that's going to have two states. So it's going to have on and off. Let's start with off. On. And we'll make on kind of the final state. That means, yes, when we're in that state, it's on. And we're going to start when we start this up, it's going to be turned off. And then when I push the button, it turns on. When I push the button again, it turns off. So this is a really simple uh, um, example. But notice, I push the button, turn it on, push it again, turn it off. So for example, if my input is push, 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 so four pushes, is that going to be on or is it going to be off? So we start here, push, 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 it's going to be off. But if I did five, push, 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 it's going to be on. So in other words, on an odd number of pushes, it turns on, on an even number, it uh, turns off. All right, so that was the first example. Uh, the next example was the binary powers of two. And let's look at, uh, so that was example one, so power, power button. All right, so binary powers of two. Oops, I forgot to switch to the document camera. So two was powers 
of 2. Now the binary powers of 2, well let's look at those. So 2 to the 0 is 1, which is equal to, in binary, 0, 1. I'll leave off leading zeros, uh, so I'll put it there. And then 2 to the 1 is 2, and that's and 2 to the 2 is 4, which looks at like that. And 2 to the 3 is 8, which looks like this. And probably by now you can kind of see the pattern developing here. Let's do one more. 2 to the 4 equals 16, which looks like this. So in other words, uh, the DFA for this, we want to, uh, leading zeros are okay. So we could have like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, that's still a binary power of 2. We could have 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, that's still the same number 2. So in other words, if we were to come up with a uh, regular expression for this, it might look something like this. It might be 0 star, because we don't need leading zeros. And then we're going to have a single one. And then we're going to have zero or more uh, zeros after that. So our regular expression will be something like zero star one, zero star. Now, how do I make a DFA for this? Well, well, first off, does it start off accepting? And the answer to that is no. It can't start off accepting because nothing is not a power of 2. So this is going to be not accepting. I'm going to go and label this Q0. But Q1, that is going to be accepting. And I get there on a 1. So on a 0, I'm going to stay here. So this lets me consume a bunch of zeros. As soon as I get a 1, I accept. And then any more zeros I get after that, I keep accepting. But what if I get another 1 from here? Well, I need to do something with that. So if I get another 1 from there, then I go back to rejecting because it's no longer a power of 2. So Q2. And then from there, once I'm in that rejecting state, nothing will ever recover from that because it's never going to be a power of 2 at that point. So we just feed this back on 0, feed that back on 1. And this is actually called a, what's called a trap state. That Once it gets into that state, it's never going to get out of it. But this embodies the same language as that regular expression does. Zero or more zeros, followed by a single one, followed by zero or more zeros. We keep accepting, but if I get another one, reject. And then from that point, once I've rejected, I'll reject, and it'll chew up all of the rest of the input and keep rejecting that. All right. The next one uh, on our list was, let me slide this up just a little bit. Binary numbers. That are evenly. Uh, actually, what uh, binary numbers evenly divisible by two. Well, let's look at some. So we've got two, four. 6, 8, 10, 12. So what do those look like in binary? Uh, I kind of went off the screen. Hold on a second. Move that up a little bit more. Right to there. Two, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. What do those look like in binary? So 2 uh, looks like that. 4 looks like that. 6 looks like that, 8 looks like that, 10 looks like that, uh, 12 looks like that. Let's just do one more. I think you can still see it. 14 looks like that. So what you'll notice is what these have in common is it's kind of any pattern we have here.
that is uh, of ones and zeros, but has to end with a zero. All right, so let's, uh, so a regex for this might be something like this. It might be something like a zero or one star, but has to end with a zero. And I suppose zero should be on our list too. That's still evenly divisible by zero. So you notice that they always end in zero. In other words, this is even binary numbers. Now, one attempt to make this, might to make the DFA, might be something like this. So just like we had up here, we had this star with zero, zero star with that feeding back to itself. We might think like, all right, here's Q zero. Well, that's zero or one star. So let's have a zero going back. Let's have a one going back, so zero or one star, and then we have to end with a zero. So we might think of that. But that's a problem. The problem here is that this is not a DFA. Why isn't it a DFA? Well, there's a couple reasons there. The first reason is that notice this Q0 on a 0 stays in Q0, but Q0 on a 0 also goes to Q1. So remember, you're not allowed to have, this has to be a function. So you can't have two edges leaving Q0 that are the same label. That makes it not a DFA. The second problem with this, it's not a total function, because Q1, what are we doing on a 0 when we're there? Well, you could maybe make that loop back to itself like that and say, well, that fixes it. But what do we do when, a, when we have a one when we're there? We don't have anything to find for that. So it has to be a total function. So the reason this is not is it's not a function and it was not a total function. I think I'm at the, okay, you can still barely see that. Now, how do we fix it? All right, so we know we're gonna start in Q0. And what I'm gonna do is if I get a one, I'm gonna stay here. But if I get a zero, I'm gonna go to accepting because it ended with a zero. And then from there, if I keep getting zeros, it still ended with zero. This is Q1. And then if I get a one, I'm going to go back. So in other words, I was accepting, accept, or reject, reject, reject any number of ones. If I get a zero, oh, a string ended in a zero, which is all I care about. If I keep getting zeros, I'm just building up more zeros. That's okay. If I get another one, I go back there. So now this is actually an answer. So we fixed. Ah, crap, you can't see that. Okay. Now, there's one other one uh, that I want you to think through. Uh, so I'm going to switch back to the slides. I'll let you think through that one. Um, but that's, uh, think about a toll booth. That 30 cents are required to open the gate and only nickels, dimes, and quarters are allowed. And it has to be exact change. So what are all of the, if we were to make a machine, we're gonna have three types of input symbol, nickel, dime, quarter. And we're gonna have states that we need to say, if I get a bunch of nickels, then that'll open it. If I get uh, only dimes or a combination of nickels and dimes, I get a quarter and a nickel, or a nickel and a quarter, those both work, uh, but we're going to have to figure out how to do that. So let me just quickly kind of sketch out what we're talking about here. So I'll switch back to the document camera and this will be the last thing we do today. Okay, so in other words, here's where we start. When we start off, I'm gonna label this toll booth.
assist for 30 cents. All right, so when we start off, we have no money at all. But if I get a nickel, I now have five cents. And if I get another nickel, I have another five cents. If I get another nickel, so now I have 10 cents. If I get another nickel, I now have 15, another one, 20, another one, 25, and then another one. Now I have 30. So that's my accepting state is 30 cents. All right, so in other words, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, open the gate. That accepts. If I only fed in one nickel, it doesn't open the gate. If I fed in two nickels, it doesn't open the gate. But now we also said we can have dimes and quarters as well. So, well, if I had a nickel and I had five cents and then I had a quarter, that could take me all the way to opening the gate. Or if I put in a quarter first, followed by a nickel, that could open the gate. But since every two nickels is a dime, I could stick in a dime here. So let's put that. A dime will take me to the 10 cent spot. So let's put D there. And then if I put another dime, and another dime. So in other words, three dimes open the gate, opens the gate, or a nickel, nickel, dime, dime, or dime, nickel, nickel, dime. That opens the gate, but we need another case too. What if I put in a nickel first and then a dime? Well, I need to do this too. So I can have a dime that jumps me ahead 10 cents this way also. So now notice I can say nickel, dime, nickel, dime, because that's 5, 15, 20, 30. So this encompasses all the combinations of nickels and dimes I could do to get me to here. Now there is one problem though. So I do nickel, dime, dime, and then I put in another dime. I don't have anything labeled. So we might want to just allow it so that the extra dime, it keeps the change. It doesn't give you change. Uh, but since we said exact change, we're just going to leave that off for now. I'm going to mention that in a second. Now the last thing we need is quarters. So I can put in a nickel and a quarter. Or if I put in a quarter here, this needs to take me all the way to there. And so that, oops, move that down just a hair. So that's all the ways that we have exact change. Now, this is not a DFA because it's not a total function. What if I put in a, a, a nickel, nickel, and then a quarter, then I would have too much money. So one of the things I'm going to put a note on here, it really should have quarter going to a trap state from all of these ones that aren't shown. So I'm just going to say trap state not shown. Or in real life, the only undefined edges. This is Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6 should go to Q6. So that way, it'll keep your change. It'll still open the gate. But if you put in two quarters, for example, uh, the first one will take you here. The next one will take you there and open the gate. and It'll just keep your uh, extra money. Now, one of the cool things about this is we now have this abstract kind of model of a machine that represents this toll booth. And notice that the way that old uh, electronic systems worked was based on a system kind of like this. So how did they make vending machines before there were things like microprocessors? Well, you'd have to have something like this that would, and it would implement this with like a set of inputs in a coin reading system. So you drop a coin in, it makes a nickel, it makes a trans this transistor turn off and that one turn on, or it would be a, could be a relay maybe that closes like a switch. So the nickel switch when it gets closed activates that. That one when it's turned on goes to that. That one when it's turned on goes to that, and so forth. So you could fit in any of those things to feed it the money, and then it would cause the action to happen. Now you could even make this so that if you fed in 
a quarter and another quarter, it would jump to a state way over here somewhere. And that would be how much change you have to give. And then it would say, okay, feed back a nickel and then feed back a dime and then feed back another dime. And now you're back to this. And when you're back to that final state, it vends the, after it gives the change, it vends the item and then resets back to the beginning to set other ones. So the simplistic machine like this could be implemented without any kind of programming, without any kind of micro, microprocessor uh, running instructions, just with hardware that was dedicated to doing this. And interestingly, if you look inside of a microprocessor, it has some stuff like that as well that says, how does the microprocessor, when it powers up, start somewhere? And then the first thing it does is fetch an instruction from a certain memory location, and then it decodes that. So really inside the microprocessor, there's kind of this DFA that's running. It's like fetch an instruction, decode the instruction, carry out some sequence of activities, and then go back to the beginning and fetch the next instruction. So it's kind of like a DFA that feeds, goes through a sequence of states and then goes back to itself. All right, so we're gonna go and uh, stop there for the day, uh, but keep in mind that uh, a couple questions, let's go back to uh, the slides just for a second here. Can a DFA, DFA be created uh, for the language of any regular expression? So this is a question for us to ponder for next class. So in other words, I have some regular expression. It de definitely defines a language. Is it possible to make one of these DFA machines for every regular, the language of any regular expression we could create? So that's question one. And question two is what about the converse? If I have a uh, DFA, is it possible to create a regular expression for it? And kind of, as you think about that, maybe think about this one. Could we make a regular expression that represents all, and, and do the one without the, that only allows exact change? In other words, if this would, Q, N, that would accept, but Q, Q would not. What about N, N? That should not accept, but N, N, D, D should accept. So is it possible to make a regular expression that defines this same language as this DFA? And if it is, then the next question is, is there some regular expression for every possible DFA we could ever create? Keep in mind that uh, the number of states you can have can be as finite, but it could be really large. The number of input symbols could be really large rather than just three like nickel, dime, quarter. It could be thousands of input symbols and hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of states. Is it possible to create a regular expression for every one of those? And I'm gonna let you think about that uh, question and we're gonna uh, see if we can figure that out uh, or at least work towards figuring that out next class. All right, let's stop there. Uh, everybody, mean to end. Everybody stay safe. Uh, uh, and next class, we'll talk more about DFAs. We're going to spend a little bit of time on them because they're a really fascinating thing. The other cool thing about DFAs to notice is how incredibly efficient they are. That while it took us a while to kind of reason through that example that we started with, like, does this string belong in this language or not? We had to kind of think about it and reason about it. A DFA it just chews through the string as fast as it can and says yes or no. And that's a really powerful piece of uh, kind of theoretical machinery uh, that we looked at today. And it's really simple how it works. But it's only really useful if we can use it for a lot of different uh, use cases, which is why we're going to try to see if it works with any regular language of any regular expression and if we can make any regular expression from any DFA. All right. That's it. Wash your hands.